There is a question that has uh, come up in the last couple of weeks. It's come in a couple of different uh, forms through a couple of different people, but it's in essence the same exact question. And I wanted to address it uh, today. I think it's a really important question. Here's the, here's the question. How can I forgive myself? How can I forgive myself? It's a good question. Um, it's a good question because in the, at the root of the question, uh, it demonstrates uh, a need uh, within the individual uh, to be forgiven, right? There's this need, inherent need, to be forgiven. Uh, in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite uh, authors, uh, he writes about the unwritten law, right? The unwritten law that there is, he's demonstrating in the early chapters of that uh, great book, Mere Christianity, he, he writes about how the law has been written in the heart of man. It's something that we kind of commonly know and understand. At the end of chapter one, he, he makes a couple of conclusion uh, points here. He says, these then are the two points I want to make. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. Secondly, that they do not in fact behave in that way. They know the law of nature, they break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. Well, I think uh, that's brilliant and true. There is within each of us a nagging uneasiness about our, the, the secrets that are in our own heart, the things that, um, that we each know and bear individually. In James uh, chapter 4, the Apostle James says, Therefore, uh, to the one who knows the right thing to do and uh, does not do it, to him it's sin. That's James 4, 17. There, James is writing about, speaking about the violation of the conscience. In this case, he's talking about the sin of omission. That is, we, we sometimes don't do the thing that we know we ought to do. And so he defines that and he says, that's sin. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but, but there can be sins. There can be violations either of uh, omission, things that we hold out that we ought to do, and then there's sins of commission, things that we do uh, that we know instinctively, intuitively uh, that are wrong, right? So sins of omission, sins of commission, uh, things that we don't do, things that we do do. Now, the whole idea of sin, right, the whole idea of sin, uh, the biblical definition of sin is, is to miss the mark, is that uh, there is a standard of righteousness and any time that we uh, miss that standard, it's sin, it's error, it's transgression. There's a variety of biblical words that uh, cover that idea. So asking about forgiveness is always a good thing, right? It is always a good thing when we're seeking to be forgiven and to understand forgiveness. It's an admission uh, of, that we know that there's a right and wrong. Right? And, and, that's where, and that's where Lewis says, hey, this, this is the foundation of clear thinking. It is a foundation of clear thinking uh, to admit uh, that we know the difference between right and wrong. And then also the seeking of forgiveness is also an admission of guilt, which again, I think is just honest, right? On, on some level, it's just simple human honesty. Now, Something that's important to uh, consider as we consider the question, how can I forgive myself, is exactly what's meant uh, by that question. 
Now, if the individual asking it is, is really meaning, how can I be forgiven, right? How can I be forgiven and how can I feel forgiven? Uh, which I think is a real disconnect for a lot of people. Um, we don't know how to be forgiven and then even how to feel kind of on a daily basis that we're forgiven, having have this guilt assuaged. Um, that is a theologically sound, and I would just say good and accurate question to have. Uh, so uh, forgiveness, uh, it implies a, a couple of important factors. Number one, it implies that there's a law, right? Uh, the whole idea of forgiveness is that there's some violation uh, uh, of a law, whether it's a written law or an unwritten law, there's a violation. So, so that's a really important thing when we're seeking forgiveness. But then also the second part of that is that the law has been violated. Okay, so theologically, to ask for forgiveness, to seek forgiveness, it's very good. It's a very sound uh, theological question. But forgiveness cannot come from the violator. I think that's really important in the way that that question has been structured as it's come to me. It's how can I forgive myself? Well, you need to know this. Uh, forgiveness can't come from the violator. Rather, it must come, forgiveness must come from the one violated. That is the one whose law has been violated. So, so to ask yourself, or to ask, how can you forgive yourself? Uh, that uh, puts oneself in the place of the lawgiver. And it's a basic misunderstanding of the guilt that you feel. Here's the thing. Here's the truth. Everyone, all people feel guilty. I know some people act as though they don't. Man, that's a whole other issue. But it's natural, and I would say by God's design... Uh, for you and I to feel guilt uh, over sin. In Romans chapter 2, verse 15, Paul uh, writes about uh, that. He says, the work of the law is written on our hearts. Right, The work of the law, the word of the law, God's law itself, it's written on our hearts. Uh, that is, we have a knowledge of good and evil. And, and he goes on in Romans 2.15 and says that our consciences bear witness, our thoughts alternately accusing or defending ourselves. And so there is this work of the law uh, written on our hearts. God uses our conscience uh, to remind us when that law has been broken. Friend, if you feel guilt, that is a good thing, right? That is a good thing. In fact, that is evidence that God is at work in your life, and the good news is your conscience is alive. Now, the second part of that is, okay, what, what do we do with it? Um, and, and let me, before I move on, let me just add this. If you don't feel guilt, right? If you don't feel guilt, uh, that's a bad thing. In fact, that's the very definition of being a sociopath, right? It's someone who has gotten to the point in their lives where they feel no guilt, no remorse, no responsibility uh, for any of their actions. Uh, that's a dangerous thing. Uh, people work very hard at this, right? It takes, I think it takes a, a great deal of time to get to a place where your conscience is so dulled and your, your heart is so calloused that you no longer feel guilt um, for your sin and your inner corruption. And so what a lot of times people do, and we certainly see this in our culture today, uh, people are seeking uh, rather than to acknowledge their sin, acknowledge their violation, they're seeking simply to redefine what is and what is not sin. Uh, and so that's, that's a really dangerous thing as people kind of put themselves in the place of the lawgiver. Now, the question is what to do about the guilty conscience. Um, there's many things that probably could be said about that, but I think from a biblical perspective, uh, one of the best illustrations that we have, uh, one of the best examples that we have, comes from uh, King David. Uh, King David is a great, um, he's a great Bible character as example. Um, he was a man who's noted uh, for loving God. God loved him. He loved God. He had a relationship with God. 
Um, he, he, he trusted in God, and yet at the same time, like us, he was a man of flesh. He was a man uh, who had a proclivity to sin. He uh, was notorious, actually, as a sinner. He was an adulterer. He was uh, guilty of murder. So we're not talking about you know, common everyday sins necessarily. We're talking about you know, capital sins, uh, top level sins, if you will. Um, here's the way David describes his own guilty conscience and the way that it felt. And you may be able to identify with this on some level, especially if you have that question about uh, how to feel forgiven. In Psalm 32, verses 3 through 4, David uh, writes about uh, the way his guilt caused him to feel. He says, When I kept silent about my sin, uh, my body wasted away, uh, through my groaning all day long, for day and night, for, I love this line, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. So uh, depending on the type of violation, this is what guilt feels like at some level, right? It, it actually can manifest itself in a physical way, in a physical way kind of trauma. Um, now, David's acknowledging that. He's saying, hey, God, I, when, when I, before I acknowledged my sin, before I confessed my sin, that is, man, I just felt this pressure. Uh, it actually was a physical thing. Um, and here's the thing, you can ignore that. And I think he even alludes to that. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, it got worse. And that's really the truth. Um, it does. It gets worse. When you ignore that guilty conscience, when you ignore uh, your sin, um, it gets worse. And you can feel that heavy hand, that loving, gentle, but heavy hand of the Lord pressing on your heart. Um, you know, in my life, I tried many things to assuage my guilt. Um, it's common for, for uh, humans, for men and women, uh, to try many things. Uh, one of the things uh, that people try is pleasure. Now you could, uh, you know, call pleasure by any uh, number of other names, entertainment or sex or whatever it is. It's a distraction from uh, ourselves and from the way that we feel. Uh, it's a chasing after a feeling of fun or uh, of excitement or some thrill. And you know what? Here's the thing that works for a while, right? It works for a while until you run out of cash until you run out of time and you run out of people to use. Um, chasing after those things, it can seem to kind of quiet uh, the, the voice of the conscience, but it only lasts for a while. One of the other ways that uh, I certainly tried and that people try in our culture uh, is they turn to drugs and alcohol. These uh, numbing kind of uh, experiences uh, whether it's a high of a drug or a low of a drug or the low of alcohol, um, you know what? Go ahead, test it out. People do. People, I'm not advocating that, by the way, but, but I'm just saying um, there's millions, right? Literally millions of people who uh, have had experience with this who can speak to, uh, uh, yes, it works for a short time, but those millions who have gotten to the other side of that uh, would only testify in one voice, with one voice, uh, to the nightmare of, you know, the, the eventual outcome uh, of trying to placate or to silence the conscience in that way. Um, it's it's short-term relief of guilt, but all, the only thing that happens is you're, uh, when you get sober or when you come down from the high, uh, your guilt is only multiplied, right? Because of some of the things that you do under the influence, and, and then just the compounded uh, guilt of knowing that that is not the right answer, and it hasn't uh, actually done anything to alleviate your very real guilt. Um, let me cut to the chase. Here's the only real answer, right? The truth is, there's really only one answer. And for the answer, I wanna just go back to David. Uh, because again, David's a great character study. Uh, he's a guy who loved God, um, but struggled with his own sin. And he gives us 
as he writes out of his own experience, he gives us uh, the best, the absolute best model in written form, what to do with guilt. Now, if you're not familiar with this passage, it's a go-to uh, passage you ought to have memorized. Write this down, uh, read it, take it in, practice it. Uh, he writes about um, his repentance in Psalm 51. It's beautiful. Let me, let me read some of it for you. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge." Notice what David does here. Right up front, he, he admits, he confesses his sin, and he cries out to God, I need you to wash me, I need you to cleanse me, I need you to forgive me. And, and notice what he says. He doesn't say, hey, Lord, help me to forgive myself. He says, against you and you only have I sinned. Now, now, David's not ignoring, I don't think he's ignoring the fact that he sinned against other people, but the violation of the law is against God. He's the author of the law. He's the one whose law we violated, and David owns that. And I just love that. This is a model for you and I. Own your sin. Whatever it is you've done, uh, don't make excuses for your sin. Don't justify your sin. Simply own it. Go to God who's merciful and loving, and say, hey, I did this, forgive me. David goes on in verse 5. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, in sin my mother conceived me. Notice he says, he's like, I'm sinful. I, I'm sinful to my core, right? He's not saying, oops, I did that thing. No, I was brought forth in iniquity. He, he's recognizing that he's a sinner. Uh, not that he's a sinner because he sinned, but he sins because he's a sinner. He says, verse 6, you desire truth in my inmost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. And then, this the pinnacle of this whole thing. He gets to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. So beautiful. Here, here's the thing. David's hope was, uh, I'm a sinner. I know I've broken the law. I'm coming to you, God. I'm asking for forgiveness. And notice that he's expecting it, right? By faith, he knows enough about God to know that God is gracious and that God will forgive and God will cleanse him. And he asks this beautiful, beautiful plea in verse 10, God created me a new heart, created me a clean heart. Uh, it's something I'm going to talk about a bit on Sunday the idea that God wants to reform, recreate in us uh, something new, something fresh. And I would just say this, something that is forgiven. Friend, God wants to forgive you. Um, now, I thought it'd be fun to hear from someone else on this topic. And so um, one of the men that I consider my own pastor is uh, Pastor David Guzik. Uh, someone that I know and love and respect. And so I've asked him uh, to weigh in on this topic. So David, take it away. Hey, Calvary Arlington family. When Pastor Jim asked me if I could weigh in and share some of my thoughts on this very important subject, I was happy to do it because I do think it is an important subject. But what does it really mean, this idea of forgiving ourselves? And do we need to forgive ourselves?
A great place to come back to, as you already know, is that wonderful promise in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which says simply this, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what? That's one of the first verses I memorized as a young uh, teenage Christian. And let me tell you, I'm so glad that that's one of the first verses I memorized because that is a verse that has served me very, very well through the years. Listen, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's really the answer to our need for forgiveness. Now, we understand the impulse that makes a person say, I need to sense that I am forgiven. And by the way, isn't that what people almost always mean when they say, I need to forgive myself? When people use that phrase, I need to forgive myself, what they're usually looking at is that deeply seated and completely understandable impulse, I need to sense that I am forgiven. So we understand the impulse, but we also need to be careful because true forgiveness comes from God and only God has the real authority to forgive. Let me say that again because it's such an important concept. Forgiveness comes from God and only God has the real authority to forgive. Ultimately, It's not within my power. It's not within the pastor's power. It's not within the priest's power. It's not with some other religious officials of power. It's not within anybody's power to forgive sins except God alone. It's not even within my power to forgive my own sins. Do you remember that great occasion? It's recorded in Mark chapter 2 where Jesus was preaching in a home and they lowered down the paralytic on the bed before him. And Jesus said those remarkable words. He said, son, your sins are forgiven you. And the religious leaders were astounded. And this is what they thought. They thought only God can forgive sins. And Jesus didn't challenge their proposition at all. Jesus agreed with it. Then he proved that not only he had the power to heal a man from his paralytic status, But Jesus also had the power to forgive his sins. And can we say, only God has the power to forgive our sins. So when somebody has that very real feeling, I need to sense that I'm forgiven. The answer is not found in forgiving yourself. The answer is by faith to receive the forgiveness that God promises to us in Jesus Christ. I'm going to say it again just because it's such a wonderful passage of Scripture. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's promise of forgiveness is even greater than my perceived ability to forgive my own sins. I don't have that ability. I don't really need that ability. I need to receive the precious forgiveness that God himself promises me. I hope you'll latch onto this. I hope you'll walk in the forgiveness that God offers to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Wow. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, You know, friend, only God, only God can forgive sins. Forgiveness is the gift of God. Right? The Bible says the wages of sin is death, separation from God. Uh, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus wants to forgive you. Um, all you need to do is turn to Him and, and, and like David did, ask Him. Right? Ask Him to forgive you and then believe His Word. I mean, I think that's kind of the trick, and especially for believers, right? I know so many believers, and even my own life at times, where we seem to just always be stumbling, always be like, oh, I want to be delivered from this. I want to get better. Hey, get better at this. Believing God's Word, He's forgiven you. And then walk in that forgiveness. Uh, let the Lord recreate that clean heart in you, and then follow that heart. Follow the direction that God would give you. Um, Yeah, He wants us to to walk in a manner uh, 
Uh, not where we're always tripping into sin, um, but more importantly than that, He wants us to walk as forgiven people. Friend, be forgiven today. Confess your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and then trust His word. Believe that He is going to do and has done exactly what He said. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. God, I pray that this truth would just minister to uh, everyone who's heard it today. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would forgive us for our sins. Lord, maybe it's for the millionth time, uh, but we're, th we're thankful, God, that you're a gracious God. You've provided uh, for sin in the person of Christ. Jesus, we look to you and what you did on Calvary. You, the Bible says, you paid the penalty for our sins. Lord, we wanna receive that and we wanna walk in that truth. May we know, may we know your forgiveness. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you guys. If you have any further questions about this, uh, please write to me. Uh, uh, you can write a comment or email or text me. I love to, to help you any way I can in walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.